Coming up with a good watch name can be tricky, which is why some brands don't even bother. They just assign a boring reference number and call it a day. A good name should be memorable, should be cool, and ideally have some sort of remote connection to the design. Last time Phoebus did a great job with this, by giving us a true monster with the Kraken. But this time, they've decided to give us a unicorn of the sea. And I have no idea what that has to do with what looks to be a 70s inspired diver. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we're going to talk about the brand new Phoebus Narwhal. And other than the goofy name, it's actually a pretty solid diver. In fact, I was a little skeptical when I first heard about it and read the specs, but this is one that has grown on me over the last few weeks. Also, just like every other Phoebus review, this watch was provided by Phoebus, and as far as I know, they're not going to be asking for it back. Hence that promotional tag at the beginning. Now, that said, let's dive into the numbers. For this one, Phoebus went with a 41mm platform, which is kind of in between your standard sizes for a diver. Although, despite that, it has a longer lug-to-lug -lug just over 50mm. In terms of thickness, the Narwhal is fairly standard for a 300m diver at just over 13mm, despite its thinner Miyota 9015 movement, and that's 13mm going from the custom case back all the way to a very slightly double-domed sapphire with AR. It's also on the heavier side for its size at 200 grams, at least give or take a few links on the bracelet, which really isn't overly surprising for a watch that has a rather prominent case design. Which for me is one part of that 70s inspiration, where here there's nothing really sexy or curvy going on, it's all about these sharp, rather well-defined angles. Which does include a couple of sharper edges on the bottom of the lugs, but overall nothing too bad. The Narwhal's case combines both brushed and polished sections. The main body itself is brushed, with a circular brushing on top and a linear brushing on the sides. But the sides also contain a set of polished beveled edges as well as these really wide front angles of the lugs, and this is where the end links of the bracelet meet the case. Now, all of this flash on the case accomplishes two things, the first of which may be the more obvious one, and that it is a fingerprint magnet, or at least that really wide flat area on the lugs. The second, these polished sections fully highlight and draw your attention to this larger-than-life case, so if you're like me and just prefer more emphasis on the dial with a more streamlined case, this is going to be a negative. But if you're someone that likes more prominent case designs, like say a Seiko Turtle, you may like this one. And if you haven't caught it already, there is a fair amount of glare going on with a narwhal. All of which really has to be coming from that slightly double dome sapphire, as the dial itself isn't very reflective. For the most part, or at least with this particular brown colorway, the clean white indices come through and are very easy to read, even despite that glare. And this is true even when you're walking around outside. But it is still a bit of an issue, and I think Phoebus would have been smarter just to go with a flat sapphire. It may not have eliminated the issue, but it would have helped mitigate some of it. To the right, we have a smaller sign screw down crown, with the Phoebus logo prominently displayed. With this particular crown, I found it to be a little harder to start to unscrew, but once you get it going, it's not too bad to use. On the rear, we have a custom case back, which is complete with that unicorn of the sea. Now, once again, I think Narwhal is kind of an odd choice to name this particular watch after, but it is nice to see Phoebus doing more custom case backs. But back to the front, let's talk about the bezel. On the Narwhal, it's stainless steel with a shiny black ceramic insert, and that does create a nice frame that does distinct from the matte dial underneath. The bezel itself isn't very wide, but the knurling is nice, and it's just tall enough to get a good easy grip on, even with those wider lugs. It's 120 click, unidirectional, with a great clicky action, as well as no back play. Pretty much exactly what you want from a bezel. Plus, it's actually lined up. And that's something some brands, even bigger ones, can't consistently get right. I mean, I love my Antarctica, but come on, Seiko. Now, just for a second, let's go back to those really polished, flashy sections of the case. They are definitely attention grabbers as you're walking around, and maybe too much so, as your focus may drift from the dial and towards the case. I think if the Narwhal had just a standard basic diver's dial, the flashiness of the case would completely overpower it. But the Narwhal's dial is, well, kinda gnarly. So it is far from standard, 
and as a whole, I think there's a decent balance between the two. So far, Phoebus has released four different colorways of the Narwhal, and I think this particular brown version is the most interesting. At its dead center, there's a slight maroonish hue to it, which then starts to fade to black once you get past the applied indices. Then the cherry on top is this pre-scratched texture to it, in some sense giving it this faux vintage or worn look. Although for me, the scratch dial is just a really visually interesting and intriguing element. One that just draws you in and also changes the look of the dial just slightly depending on the angle of the light. Moving further out on the dial, you get to the indices, and this is my favorite aspect of the watch. They are applied and have a decent height, giving the watch some needed depth. One thing I really like is how the tops of the indices are brushed, and that gives them a the rougher texture which matches the scratched dial. Yet the angled side edges of the indices are polished, subtly catching the light, and when you combine that with the large white luminous centers, really help them stand out. Most of the indices are these silver bars, where the three at the cardinal points are larger wedges that also extend back into the chapter ring, creating a platform for the off-yellow dots to inhabit it. This not only creates a nice crosshair effect, which draws your eyes right to the center, but it also literally creates a bridge into the chapter ring, and that just brings cohesion into the entire design. If it wasn't for this, I think those off-yellow dots sitting in between the cardinal points would look really off and just really strange. They do tie into that 70s style case, but otherwise the rest of the watch is rather modern. With those dots integrated into the indices, as well as the rougher brush texture surrounding them, just helps tie everything together nicely. For the hands, the narwhal uses a set of segmented wedges, and if there is one weak point to the entire design, it's these hands. The styling matches that of the indices, but for my taste, they are just far too short. Going down the center line of the dial, we have the Phoebus logo at the top, a small amount of text just above the 6, as well as a nicely framed date window sitting right at the 6. So first off, let's talk about that ever-controversial Phoebus logo. Now personally, I've always liked it, just because I think it's a little different, and I think it gives their watches some needed character. Yet it is one thing that people have always constantly complained about for being too strange. Although, as time has gone on, I think that controversy has waned a bit. I think some people have just warmed up to it, and others have just gotten tired of complaining about it. They probably still don't like it, but they just don't care anymore and have moved on. Now, despite the glare from the crystal and despite the short hands, I really like the dial on the narwhal. In fact, this may be my favorite Phoebus style design of all. It's not overly complicated and for the most part, it's relatively simple and clean. More importantly though, it's very easy to read, as well as there are so many visually interesting elements that seem to capture your attention. All of those elements come through in order to read the watch clearly, while the rest are just sitting in the background waiting for you to notice them. And this is all while maintaining a beautiful sense of symmetry. Going down the center line of the dial, from the extra large wedge at the 12, to the logo, to the date, Everything here just seems well balanced and exactly where it needs to be. The only exception may be those off yellow or old radium dots that are sitting in between the cardinal points, but even those do get tied into the grander scheme of things. And as a whole, I think the narwhal is just enjoyable to look at. It's a watch that's easily able to capture your attention and hold it, which is no simple feat. As for the loom, Phoebus as usual did a great job. I really like the loom profile Phoebus did here, with the dual colors of the dial, as well as the bezel lighting up and framing everything in. Phoebus reportedly used 15 layers both BGW9 and Old Radium loom on the dial. And here at relative time, that Old Radium style loom is also known as Fadium. And as you might expect, the green loom from the Fadium does exactly that, fading out quite a bit before the blue BGW9. Although the blue loom does stay in it for the long haul, which you can see in this comparison test. And for the heck of it, I did include the Kraken right next to the narwhal, so you can see the difference between the two. In the end, the Kraken I think just edges out the narwhal. But the important thing is that both Phoebi outlast the Seiko on the end. So overall, I'd say they're both great. For the movement, the narwhal is using a Japanese Miyota 9015. 
a great overall choice for this particular price range, as it lets you get a watch with a reliable high beat movement without paying the premium that comes along with Swiss based options. Now, as for the bracelet, it's overall pretty good and what you've come to expect from Phoebus. Solid end links, solid links secured with screws, and a great milled push button clasp. The edges of the bracelet have a slight sharpness to them, and despite how they look, they don't fully articulate. Yet, as a whole, it's a pretty solid and well made bracelet. From a design perspective, I actually like how this looks, and I'm glad Phoebus didn't go with just the standard oyster style bracelet. But I'm not quite sold on how the end links look integrating into the case. That big chunk of brushed metal looks kind of off sitting in that wall of polish. But otherwise, I think it's a great bracelet that you'll enjoy keeping on the watch. And if you get bored with it, I'm sure you can find a few straps that'll look perfect with it. With the brown colorway, I actually found two. On the wrist with the bracelet, the watch is fairly comfortable throughout the day. One of my biggest concerns with the narwhal, at least on paper, was the longer lug to lug. Personally, with my seven and a quarter inch wrist, I prefer around a 48 millimeter lug to lug. And this one is a bit over that. And as a result, there is some overhang. However, the female end links bring that effect of lug to lug down a bit, and it does compensate when wearing it. So that's not so much an issue, but what is is that thanks to the case design, the watch has a really large presence, not just visually, but also in terms of how it feels on the wrist. And if there's really one thing that's going to keep me from enjoying this watch in the long run, it's that feel on the wrist. Seriously, the Narwhal may only be a 41 millimeter, but it feels larger and chunkier than my 43 millimeter Orient Star Diver. Now it's one with a more streamlined case, but still. So that larger feel on the wrist is something you really need to pay attention to. And it's kind of a pity for me personally, because I really enjoy the style. Not only does it look cool and is unique, but it's honestly a joy to look at. And even with that glare, it's still very clear and easy to read. Lastly, let's talk about price and value. Now, the MSRP for the Narwhal is $480. But as usual with Phoebus, there are discount codes always floating around, including the relative time code for this channel. And with that, it brings it closer to $430. Which these days is not bad for a watch with a Miyota 9015, and especially one with a really complicated dial. You may find a few better deals out there, like say a Richard Legrand Ocean Fair, but for a variety of reasons, those 300 to 350 Miyota 9000 series watches are a lot harder to find these days. In fact, the original Phoebus Eagle Ray, which had a 9015, came in around 350 bucks, and that's a watch that really put Phoebus on the map. But even Phoebus can't quite do that anymore. So times are a changing. Now, in a nutshell, there are some things here I love, and a few things I'm not fond of. But as a whole, I think the Narwhal is good, if not a great diver. It's an unusual, fascinating design with a ton of presence. Yet it's done in a way that's rather simple and easy to read. Generally, I think the Narwhal is going to be good for someone that wants maybe a larger presence in a watch, but maybe not dinner plate overkill. In terms of a recommendation, I think this one really comes down to two things, both of which are really personal preferences. The first is whether or not you like a more streamlined case design, or you like one with more of a prominent presence, which is where the narwhal lies. And second, it's all going to come down to what size of watch you find comfortable on your wrist. This is a 41, but I think it wears larger, more like a 42 or 43. So if that's typically what you like to wear, then this unicorn of the sea might be what you're looking for. Anyway, that's my take on the Phoebus Narwhal. Goofy name, solid diver. As always, let me know your thoughts down below. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Shane. This is Relative Time. See you next time.